Two years ago, many of us had never even heard of a coronavirus. But global public health institutions, such as the Centers for Disease Control, the World Health Organization, and the Public Health Agency of Canada certainly had, and they were springing into action. Now, as we approach the second anniversary of the onset of the worst global pandemic in a century, what did those big players get right, and where did they go wrong? Let's find out and ask. In Washington, D.C., Lawrence Gostin, university professor in global health law at Georgetown University and director of the World Health Organization Collaborating Center on National and Global Health Law. In Montreal, Quebec, Dr. Joanne Liu, professor at McGill University School of Population and Global Health, where she's the director of the Pandemics and Health Emergencies Ready Lab. And in the Bloor Court neighborhood of Ontario's capital city, Mario Possumai, who was a senior advisor on the SARS Commission and is currently a consultant in occupational health and safety issues. And we're delighted to welcome you three to TVO tonight uh, for a, uh, a conversation that I guess it's okay for us to have now, given that this pandemic is uh, almost two years old, certainly enough time to start looking back and learning some lessons. And to that end, I want to start by just reading this excerpt from the Washington Post science and politics writer, Joel Aschenbach, who wrote the following. Officials with the World Health Organization could have been faster to declare a public health emergency of international concern. They punted on that on January 23, 2020, citing the absence of confirmed cases of human-to-human -human transmission outside of China. A week later, they acknowledged the obvious. We were all in trouble. At that point, the virus had seeded itself in 18 countries. Okay, Lawrence Gostin, get us started here. Could our global health institutions have prevented much of what we have experienced over the past two years, in your view? Probably not. Um, having said that, I do think that um, uh, China misled the World Health Organization, saying that there was not human-to-human -human transmission when there clearly was widespread community transmission. And at the same time, um, I think the WHO uh, amplified that incorrectly. Um, so there are a lot of lessons to be learned. It was our only shot to, to keep this epidemic under control, um, but probably we would have still ended up in the place we are now because it's a fast-moving respiratory virus. Joanne Liu, what's your view on that? Well, I think that... Um we got a bit, uh, I would say, sidetracked by uh, some of the geopolitical tension back then. That's one thing. Uh, and the other thing is, as well, is there might be some delay in terms of calling for public health emergency of international concern. But I guess the biggest delay that happened at the beginning of this pandemic is the what we call the last month of February, when we declared the public health emergency of the international concern, and very few countries actually started to take any measure about, uh, I would say, um, responding to, to this epidemic. And so therefore, nothing happened. So last month of February, and then finally the celebration of a pandemic on March 11. Mario Passabine, what's your view? I think it could have gone much, much better. I think the, the great failure of the WHO and our own public health agencies is that uh, between SARS-1 and the advent of, of the pandemic, we had a, a golden era of research into aerosol transmission that revolutionized uh, how we understand that uh, respiratory diseases are spread. But uh, all that knowledge, all that information was ignored by the, uh, by the agencies leading up to, to, uh, to COVID. And then once an emergency was declared, uh, they were so, so slow in implementing uh, airborne mitigation measures. So I think that's a, a real institutional failure and things that have gone much, much better. All right, well, let's look back. Uh, you know, SARS was, uh, oh gosh, how long ago is it now? 2003, I guess. I want to look a little bit further forward from that because, Joanne, in your previous role, you were head of, uh, international head of Doctors Without Borders. You were overseeing uh, one of the infection outbreaks which preceded COVID. And in this case, I'm talking about Ebola in West African countries. This would be around 2014 now. And I wonder, in your view, whether institutions such as the World Health Organization or the Centers for Disease Control did they effectively make a difference in that case? You mean in that case in Ebola? Yes. Right. I think in 2014 has, has been the acid test for WHO in terms of responding to, I would say, um, 
a fatal um, reg regional epidemic. And then back then, I think that they were very slow. And then although we complain about this pandemic of declaring the public health emergency the national concern, with Ebola, it took six months. With COVID-19, it took six weeks. So just to keep things in perspective. So I think that in, in Ebola time, WHO was very slow in terms of admitting that there was this out of control epidemic in the region of Western Africa, and as well as well in terms of ramping up and then uh, helping in terms of the response. So uh, this is this is what they, they they were missing in terms of being the convener, in terms of alerting, in terms of making sure that the world was giving a hand to get the Ebola epidemic under control back then. Okay, that's good perspective to have. Mario, how about when it came to SARS in 2003? How, how either better or worse did those international institutions act in that case? Well, uh, WHO was, was, was problematic for Canada during the uh, SARS-1. Um, it, it, uh, it, it clamped down, it, it, uh, it, it imposed a, an outside uh, quarantine, if you will, on Canada and, and travel to Canada. And I think that there was a real disconnect in terms of communication between Canada and WHO. And I think that's, that's one area that, 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 that was fixed uh, after SARS. I think that uh, uh, what wasn't fixed was that uh, SARS exposed uh, a real institutional lack of, of, of uh, capacity uh, to, to study uh, uh, disease transmission, both at the WHO and, and in Canada. And, and that was not addressed. And I think that's... Uh, that's a failure that needs to be to be addressed now, I, ho I would hope. Okay, Lawrence, with these two historical examples now part of our understanding and part of the historical record, do you think the World Health Organization, as an example, had the powers it needed to act appropriately to protect us as best it could as it relates to this coronavirus? Clearly not. Um, in many ways, the world has the WHO that um, it deserves because it's not uh, given them political backing. They've been in the middle of a geopolitical struggle, particularly during COVID with um, China and the United States. Um, with, we haven't given them the powers that they need, that even though uh, after SARS-1, the international health regulations were revised, um, uh, we still didn't give them the uh, powers that we clearly needed in this pandemic. And then, um, as Joanne says, you know, after Ebola, which was a, an utter failure, there were reforms at WHO. There was a new health emergencies unit, um, which has really been performed, I think, quite well. But again, we haven't funded them very well. And so WHO is starved of funding. It has the funding of about the size or probably a little less than a large U.S. teaching hospital one quarter of the size of the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Um, and we really need to do a lot better in providing political support, legal powers, and financial sustainability um, for the World Health Organization. Until then, we're going to continue to have a weak WHO when we need them most. Joanne, I noticed you had a big smile on your face at the beginning of that answer, but it didn't seem to me like it was a smile of happiness. What was that smile about? No, I think that uh, Lawrence is quite right. And I think that WHO has been undermined uh, throughout and it remains undermined. And this is why they're not able to do their job. And, and the reality is, is uh, it, 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 it really is suiting people to have a WHO is not empowered and not threatened. And the reality is, is we all pay for that. So that being said, I think that that uh, in terms of operation, I think they have dramatically improved. But I think where we need them, and this is what we were alluding before, and was we need them, you know, what they are mandated for, which is not as much to go personal, but to be able to give norms and guidance when such epidemic happen. And this is where I think that in this particular uh, sequence of COVID-19, they were like uh, like the other guest said. They, they, they unfortunately did not enforce the fact that they were aerosol and to mitigate and take the real measure uh, re with respect to that. So this is what is, uh, is, on, is unfortunate. But just to say something positive, 
is the legacy of Ebola, which has been massive and we, we, think, we tend to forget, is the fact that we follow through with what we call the WHO R&D, Research and Development Blueprint. And because of that, we put some sort of clear rule about how to do discovery for new vaccine or new treatment. And it was about open source sharing and, and, and about doing clinical trials during the time of pandemic or epidemic, things we were not doing before Ebola. And we did that for, for COVID-19. And this is something that probably you know, has helped us to be better, I would say, a tool to answer the, the pandemic. Lawrence, maybe you could help me understand something which I suspect many of our viewers don't get right now, which is this, well, I think Joanne described it as an undermining of the World Health Organization. Why would countries want to undermine the mission of the WHO during a time of a once in a century global pandemic? Yeah, I mean, the question itself is jaw dropping, isn't it? Um, you know, why would they? Um, and I think, you know, you, you, you know, part of the reason is, is that um, we've devolved toward, you know, populism and nationalism. It's my country first, it's me first, rather than my community, my, my country, my world. Um, and you had two, you know, strong men leaders, Xi Jinping and Donald Trump. Um, probably Donald Trump may have been even worse. Um, that were uh, using WHO as a football. Um, at the at the time, President Trump actually uh, sent a letter to uh, UN Secretary General Guterres, um, giving notice that the United States would withdraw from the World Health Organization. At the time, I wrote in the Washington Post that it was the most ruinous presidential decision in my lifetime. And of course, President Biden on his first day in office reversed that. But you know, your question answers itself. Why would any country want to do that? And I think it is because of populism and nationalism. And I want to turn back to something you know that um, we talked about with SARS-1, which was the travel bans against Canada. We've seen this, we saw it in Ebola, and it was very unhelpful uh, in West Africa. And we've seen it in spades um, with COVID-19, uh, most recently against uh, Southern Africa, um, for being transparent, for being brilliant scientists, and they get punished for it. And that's happened throughout the pandemic, and it's inexcusable. Well, Mario, since we're back talking about SARS again, let's talk about the Public Health Agency of Canada, which of course we hear from pretty much every day now during this coronavirus crisis. Was there such an organization back in the early 2000s when you were dealing with SARS? No, no, uh, the, uh, the Public Health Agency of Canada arose from SARS and was based on uh, recommendations from Justice Archie Campbell who headed the, the SARS Commission. But uh, a, a real problem was that what Justice Campbell uh, recommended was that the agency be, be multidisciplinary. That is, it include infectious disease and epidemiologists, but also engineers, uh, bioaerosol experts, physicists, uh, all the disciplines that uh, we need to understand pathogens. And, and that was not done. And I think it, uh, it was a fatal, not a fatal flaw, but a, a very serious flaw. And one that uh, has emerged during, during uh, COVID-19 as being a real a real problem for our response. We'll follow up on that if you would, Mario, because if we got the Public Health Agency of Canada as a result of SARS, when the, when the coronavirus hit, we're talking now either December, or I guess January 2020, and then March it's official, wh what was its mission, or what should its mission have been in those earliest of days, given that it was now dealing with a global pandemic? Well, you know, it, it, it decided right from the start that this was not an airborne disease. It ruled that out. It should have kept an open mind. And, and you know, there was, uh, during that time, uh, there were Chinese scientists and, and, uh, and doctors who were writing articles in, um, in, in the Lancet saying, uh, we believe this is airborne. We have gone to airborne precautions. You should consider it too. Uh, th th there was also th the fact that uh, China uh, on January 20th had itself gone to airborne precautions and deciding that uh, the large droplet precautions that the WHO was recommending were no longer effective. But uh, the, the Public Health Agency of Canada ignored all that 
and decided that uh, this was not an, uh, an airborne disease and when they should have kept an open mind. And I think that was just a, a very destructive, troubling decision that has really hampered our, our, our response. And I think it's led to things like, uh, like lockdowns being the only effective tool when in fact we had many, many other tools that we could have used and should have used. Joanne, do we have any better understanding two years later of why the public health agency would have made that decision? I don't think I can offer an answer to that, but uh, I think it's very unfortunate because we're still paying the price today of not basically adjusting our measure uh, as we are actually easing uh, the different public health measure. And, uh, and so not recognizing the very basic uh, contribution of aerosol in the transmission of COVID-19 is such a huge mistake. And, and as we are right now, you know, taking off masks everywhere, including in the school after the, the winter break, that's going to be very problematic. So I think that if we want to, to make sure that we are able to coexist with the COVID-19, we need to acknowledge and enact, the, we say, uh, updated measure with respect to aerosols. All right. Having said that, Lawrence, once, once we did figure out not we, once they, the experts, once they all figured out that it was aerosol, how quickly did they adapt to this new information and rethink their strategies for the world essentially taking it on? Yeah, well, you know, we, you go back and, and you look at the early days of uh, the pandemic, even after a year, it wasn't just the Public Health Agency of, of, uh, of Canada that was slow to react. Um, the World Health Organization itself um, didn't really fully recognize aerosolized spread early on, nor did the, the US um, CDC and other public health agencies. But even after we knew, um, we've had awfully difficult times um, with you know, basic infection control measures like um, you know, masking, social distancing, occupancy limits. Um, uh, business restrictions uh, in terms of, you know, going to restaurants and things like that. And, you know, if you had to pinpoint one clear vulnerability in the countries that performed least well, like my own, the United States, it would be a lack of trust in government and a lack of trust in your fellow citizens. Um, and so what we've really seen in North America, Europe, and others is the culmination of, you know, what I like to call kind of me, you know, everybody's asking the question, what are my rights? You know, what does government owe me? And we've stopped asking the question, what do we as a community, as neighbors, as a country, owe to our fellow citizens, owe to our fellow global citizens of the world? And how can we make a difference for the common good We've lost that tradition of the common good, and I think it served us really badly during COVID-19. How we recapture it um, is going to be very difficult, but we must. Well, you, you've asked the question, and I'd love you to follow up on it right now. Do you think that, the, I mean, given, given the political times in which we live, do you think these institutions can do anything to steer themselves into positions of greater trust with the electorate? Well, you know, we need to have much um, clearer messaging. Um, there's been really confused messaging um, from, you know, governments around the world, particularly even from the U.S. CDC, which has really been a, you know, in the past a crown jewel um, among public health agencies. Um, the World Health Organization has also failed in that regard. Um, but ultimately, I think it's not these agencies' fault. They've tried hard. They're scientists. They're dealing with scientific uncertainty. The problem is, is that, you know, our societies are crumbling. You could see it with the, the truckers' convoy in, in Ottawa and the rest of Canada that spilled over to the rest of the world. You can see it in the kind of political division and hate. Um, I was really taken aback at the CPAC convention, the conservative um, a, a convention in Florida the other day when um, when they mentioned Justin Trudeau and and I don't think Justin Trudeau has done it you know everything right by a long shot but he was booed 
Um, and it's just a question of, you know, the bitter ranked, rancor that we have in our political communities and how we how we end that. I don't know. Um, I I think it's going to need somebody that really is a healer, and we just don't seem to have that at the moment. Well, Mario, I'm I gather that that's some of the reason that people have lost faith in these institutions is that they have felt that, well, I guess a couple of things. Number one, they haven't really uh, understood the recommendations that have been suggested. The recommendations, as Lawrence just suggested, ha have, have suffered from communications problems from time to time, conflicting advice offered as well from time to time. But the other thing is this notion that these groups can sort of operate in unaccountable space. So let me ask you about that. To whom are these organizations ultimately accountable? Well, you know, they, they, sh they should be accountable to their stakeholders. And, and here in Canada, uh, that's been a real, real gap. We don't have accountability. We don't have transparency. Uh, we don't know how decisions are made by the Public Health Agency of Canada and other agencies. It's like the old uh, sausage making, you know, it's all done behind closed doors. So. You know, we don't know why they, did, why they decided to rule out airborne transmission way back when. We don't know why they continue to, uh, to say that this was a drop of disease long after most everyone realized that it wasn't. And they've done some really goofy, goofy things. Uh, for example, <clears throat> not that long ago, I had to go to uh, take a, a family member to a hospital. I had my N95 and I was asked to take it off. And, and, and afterwards, you know, which makes no sense, they said, you can wear your N95 if you put a surgical mask on it, which again, makes, makes no scientific sense. So, <laughs> so, so, you know, and, and, and uh, you know, there was a study in 2014 by the Canadian uh, researcher, Lida Bourouabov of, of MIT, which showed that the, the two meter rule made no sense. And yet everywhere you go, they tell you to, to, to stay apart uh, two meters. So, you know, part of the problem is that our agencies have, have brought it on themselves. Lack of accountability, lack of transparency, and lack of, of keeping up with the science. And we really need to, uh, to change that, uh, possibly through a national inquiry and possibly through other ways to, to hold them accountable and transparent. So uh, big decisions like deciding that a disease is not airborne should be the subject of, uh, of legislative hearings where there would be other experts and people should be able to see how exactly these decisions are made. Mario, when you told that story about going into the hospital and, and having, them, <laughs> having them force you to take that N95 off so they could put on a lousier mask in its, in its place, um, Joanne smiled, Lauren smiled, I smiled. Um, <laughs> I'm betting everybody who's watching or listening to this right now has had that same experience where, they, where you walk in with a high quality N95 mask and they ask you to remove it so you can put on this piece of cloth that is worse, but they hand you with a pair of tweezers. I don't get that either. <laughs> I don't get that either. But okay. Um, anyway, that aside, Joanne, if there is another pandemic, or maybe I should say when there is another pandemic, do you think the World Health Organization will be able to stand up to the next bit of political pressure? whether it comes from the United States or China or whoever, have they learned enough from the current circumstances to be able to act differently in the future? Well, um, just to echo what Lawrence I said, I think it's going to be very, very difficult unless we really decide to, to make them able to face the music, meaning to finance them and to give them sustainable financing. And if we don't give that, then that's going to be very hard for them to be independent in terms of being able to communicate what they know in real time, being able to do investigation when there's a new emerging pathogen like they haven't really been able to do in China. So if we want the WHO that we dream for and then we hope for, then we need to as well uh, put, uh, put the money that is necessary to make them reach that level of competences and, uh, and action. And so I think that uh, I think it's going to be difficult. That being said, is is I think that everybody has learned so much through this pandemic, and I think that we all have uh, grown in it. So that would be, uh, we, I, I think that we are I would say slow learner on few things, but I think we still learn. 
But I think as well, um, it is key and 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 I would say fundamental that we try to avoid what I call the double fault of not being prepared and not learning. And then we need to continue to be able to do independent investigation on those different bodies that are basically um, uh, running the show when there's a, a public health emergency of international concern. And so uh, if we don't do this sort of pause and reflect what went well and what went wrong, uh, then that's going to be difficult. And then my biggest, I would say, issue now is that we basically go into what I call rush into a collective amnesia of what happened and just move on and not do this exercise of a postmortem to learn the lesson to be learned. Well, our slogan here at TVO is never stop learning. And it sounds like you're saying that's pretty good advice for these international health institutions as well. And with that, I want to thank Lawrence Gostin and Dr. Joanne Liu and Mario Possumai for joining us on TVO tonight. Thanks for sharing your views, you three. Be well, stay safe, and hopefully we'll see you down the road. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.